probably the book of Matthew was one of the first books in Christianity used, in, used for discipleship. Before every discipleship was created in Christianity, for many theologians and, and pastors and, and the fathers of the church, the book of Matthew was the first discipleship book in history. It was a book used for disciple the church. As many church Jews, proselytes, who were converted from Judaism to Christianity, they used this very book, the book of Matthew, to understand, to learn what is the Christian life. Now, when Jesus, after he was baptized and was tempted in the desert after 40 days of fasting, he called his disciples, as we say the last week, and created a new network, a net to bring more people to Christ. Now, here, as many people start to follow Jesus, as they saw in the first Jesus campaign, practically the first Jesus evangelist tour among the Capernaum and the cities of the, the sea of, around the city of Galilee, Many people started to follow Jesus as they, they saw Jesus um, performing many miracles and healing and, and teaching and, and preaching in the synagogues. Now, we see the first disciples of Christ following him when he was still in earth. And as Jesus was preaching and teaching in the synagogues, he, on one of these days that he was preaching and teaching and healing, he decided to go up, as we see here in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, to the mount, mountain side. He went to the mountain side of the region of Galilee and he started to teach here to his disciples. So his disciples came to him and in verse 2, the Bible said that he began to teach to them. To teach to them. To who? To the crowds? No, to the disciples. So he started to teach to the disciples this famous teaching that is called it the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes. Many scholars said that, yes, the Beatitudes are, or this teaching of the Beatitudes are for some kind of People, some kind of Christians. The Catholic Church actually, they taught that these Beatitudes are for those who have a special level of spirituality or special position in church. Not just for simple clearly, not just for simple church members or church core. This, this sermon, this was, it was only for those who have some kind of level of discipleship. Not for the crowd. Because Jesus just left the crowd and he went to the Mount Zion and he took to, to see disciples. That's what the Catholic teaching was. But this teaching was wrong. Because Jesus was not teaching only to his disciples, but he was teaching as the evangelist Matthew was recording here for all who will follow Jesus. Truth. The sharing of the disciples. So this message was not only for the disciples, or for those who are in, 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 in church, in, in some kind of level of Christianity or spirituality, but it was for all who called themselves Christians, who called themselves followers of Christ. So in other words, if you are calling yourself Christian, if you are calling yourself a follower of Christ, then you are his disciple already. So you don't need to have a, a special Bible study or a special training to say, tell yourself that you are a disciple of Christ. What makes you a disciple of Christ is that you confess your sins and you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you declare with your public testimony that you are a follower of Christ. Now how people will know that you are a follower of Christ? As you receive the baptism. But with your own confirmation, with your own desire. Not because your parents dedicated when you were a child, but because you, as an adult, as a person who have reason and understanding what you're doing, you confess, yes, I'm following on Christ. Through the baptism again or through the confirmation. Both are, are okay. 
So, if you say that you are a follower of Christ, then you are already a disciple of Christ. Then what you need to do? You need to obey and follow what teaches what Jesus was taught. Because that's what Jesus said at the end. Go and make disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father, and Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching everything that I have commanded you. Teaching everything. Not just one thing. Not just two, three things. Everything. So Jesus, give us the Beatitudes to learn how to live as followers of Christ. So it's not just for a certain people. It's not for a certain kind of clearly in church, bishops or priests or anyone or, 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 or deacons or, or presbyterians. No, it's for everyone who follow and love Jesus. Some other scholars, they say that these Beatitudes are also a teaching for not this generation, but for the millennium, when Jesus come again and ruled the world for thousands of years. The millennium is called. So these scholars say that it's hard to obey and follow these Beatitudes as God's commandment because nobody is perfect to do that today in the life that we are living today. But this is for the time when Jesus will be with us. Ruling the church again in the millennium. In some part, these scholars are right to say that Jesus will come to us and, and lead us and teach us again and rule us in the millennium. But these teachings are not postponing until the millennium. It's for today, for all of us to put in practice because we, today, we can be peacemakers. We can be also uh, merciful. We can be hungry and thirst of, of righteousness. We can be uh, meek. We can be. Uh, we can mourn, and we can be exposed to persecution. From today, we don't need to wait to the millennium to to experience that. We can experience that today. So these teachings are not for special Christians. These teachings are not for the millennium. These teachings are for today and for everyone who comes to church, who follow Jesus and call Jesus God, Savior, and Lord. Now, as I, I entitled this sermon today, The Sermon for Happy People. Because this sermon is not just for anyone who follows Christ, but for anyone who wants to follow Christ happily. Because if you follow Christ sadly, with sorrow, regretting for becoming a Christian, then you you are following Christ by force. You are following Christ because of your performance, or because you are following a tradition. You are not following Christ happily. You are not happy to be Christian. You are not happy to follow Christ. So this sermon is not for you. But if you really follow Christ, and you happily follow Christ, knowing what makes you happy, then this sermon is for you. This teaching is for you. This war is for you. Are you happy to be a Christian? Or are you regretting for being a Christian? Are you sad to be a follower of Jesus? Or are you sad that people call you Christian or identify you to be a Christian? Are you proud to be a Christian? Are you happy that you are living a, a Christian life and the Lord is your king? The Lord is your God. Everybody in this world, they are looking for two sins. Everybody in this war, they are looking for things that are meaningful in their life. These two sins for everybody, Christians or no Christians, are to have love and to be happy. In other words, everyone in this war, Christians or no Christians, are pursuing for love and are pursuing for happiness. If someone said that you don't want love and you don't want to be happy, you are not from this world. You are an alien. You are an E.T. <laughs> your head is big. Your body is small. You are not from this world. Because everybody in this world, they pursue love. They want love and they pursue happiness. They want to be happy. 
Do you want to be happy? Do you want to be loved? Then you can have all these two things in Christ. So in order to be happy in this world, we have to do what God commands. If we do what God commands, then we are assured happiness. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. If you have Jesus with you, you have a happy life. If you have the assurance that Jesus is with you, then you have happiness guaranteed in your life. And you have Jesus in you because God's love is in you. So if you have love, the love of God, then you are happy. Then you are blessed. Then you can do what every, what every, everything that God words command. Because you know that you have Jesus in your side and you know that you have His Spirit in you who help you and avail of you to do everything that God's command. Today, we have seen that this war is squeezing many Christians. Are they also evaluate Christians with these Beatitudes. Okay, if you are a Christian, are you, are, are you poor in the spirit? Do you mourn? Are you meek? Do you have hungry and thirsty thirst of righteousness? Are you merciful? Are you pure in heart? Are you peacemaker? Are you persecuted for your faith? That's what people said these days. You are a real Christian, show me the, the fruits. As Apostle Paul said, the fruit of the Spirit are nine. They are not nine because we have first love, then peace, then joy, as we are getting together one fruit by another. But all the fruits are one. Actually, the, the, the word fruit is not in plural, but it's in singular in, in the Greek Bible. The same way, these Beatitudes is not just in the, independent of each other. If you are a Christian, then you are poor in the spirit, you are so merciful, you are a peacemaker, you can, you, you are, you, your heart is pure, just because you are Christian. So the Beatitudes are not separated, but they are as a combo, complementing each other. We need to bear the fruit of the Beatitudes as we have, as we say at the beginning of the year, the virtues of the kingdom of God. Speaking truth all the time, be faithful, be, be servanthood. All these things are not separating for a Christian life. They are part of our Christian life. The first beauty to show us that what God is looking for is someone who is poor, not materially, but poor in the spirit. In other words, someone who is in need all the time who is recognizing that have lacks in life. Now, it's interesting that even Jesus, the same Jesus who preached this beatitude, said to the church of Laodicea, these very words in Revelation chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, as we say, we see here. So because you are lot warm, look warm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to speak to you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you don't realize that you are rich, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Now the church of Laodicea was a church that they think that they have everything. They don't need anything. But... They were not the church that God was looking for. Or there was not the church that was giving a good testimony for the war. They think that they have everything. The good teaching, traditions, preachers, pastors, and good members. That they don't need even God. They don't need even the Holy Spirit. And it was the Holy Spirit who was speaking to this church that was rich that was full of everything, that need not nothing, the Holy Spirit was saying, you are wretched, pitiful, 
poor, blind, and naked. Why? Why the Holy Spirit was saying this? Why Jesus, in the spirit of the prophecy, was saying to the church of Laodicea, that is representing many churches today in this world, that we are lacking of everything, even though we think that we have everything that we need to continue God's ministry. These Beatitudes are no other things that the attitudes that, wa that God wants to see in us. It's not about commandments. It's about attitudes. The Christian attitudes. It's not about ethics too. It's about being a Christian. In order to understand the Beatitudes, you need the cross of Jesus in the middle. If you put the cross of Jesus in the middle, then you can understand that these Beatitudes are simply the attitudes to be. Do you catch what I'm picture here? You just need to put this T, because attitudes is spelling with two T's. A-T-T-I-T-U-D-E-S. But beatitude is just with one T. So if you want to understand that beatitude is the attitude of the heart, then you need the cross of Jesus in your heart. You need the cross of Jesus and say, God, I'm a sinner. And the only way that I can be happy is because of what you have done in my life and what you are doing in my life and what you're going to do in my life that that will make me happy. Many people these days, they don't know what they are doing, but they are looking for happiness. They are looking for love. In this time of Jesus, people also, they were looking for happiness. He had audience that were listening to this Sermon of the Mountain. Now, once again, Jesus was not talking to the disciples because Matthew the Sermon of the Mountain comes from Matthew chapter 5 to Matthew chapter 7. So after he teached the Beatitudes to the disciples, then Jesus continued teaching to the rest of the crowd. So the crowd also listened to him. I don't know how, how that happened. It takes like hours or days, we don't know. Maybe a scholar are discussing that, that the, the Sermon on the Mount is just not just one sermon, but there are a collection of many sermons. It's not just one day, but there were several days. And people start to listen to this, this teaching of Jesus. But one way or another, people were there listening to Jesus. And these beatitudes or this teaching, they were, re, re, they, were, they were spreading around the churches, around Capernaum and Galilee. So in this time, after 400 years of silence, after the last prophet in the Old Testament, Malachi, then in the New Testament, God started to speak to us through His Son, Jesus. After four years of silence, God speaks again to people. So during these 400 years, there were some kind of people who you didn't find in the Old Testament. There were the Zealots, the Sadducees, and the Pharisees. These people were not in the Old Testament. But during these 400 years of silence, they appear in history. So when Jesus was preaching the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mountain, there were Zealots, there were Sadducees, and there were Pharisees. These three groups, they were looking for happiness too. They were looking for love too. But in this way, as today, we still have these Zealots, Sadducees, and Pharisees, in the time of Jesus, the Zealots, they thought that happiness come from going against. The Zealots, they thought that happiness come from going against. Against what? Against power. Against government. Against everything that have authority. So they tried to take that power, to take, that, to take down the government. And they think that if they get that power, if they have that authority, if they have the governing in their hands, then they can be happy. 
And we have a, still in this world this kind of people like zealots who wants to take power, who wants to take authority, and he say, if I have power, if I have authority, then I'm going to be happy because I have control of other people's life. The other side, the Sadducees, they believe that happiness comes from going ahead. The Zealots, they think that happiness comes from going against. The Sadducees, they think that happiness comes from going ahead. They just do whatever they want, they just go ahead. They didn't believe in the life everlasting. They didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. They just believed that this life is all that they have. And if they die, that is over. So they, they don't believe in consequences. And they don't believe also in rewards. That's where the status is. And they say, okay, we just go ahead. If we just go ahead doing what well, we want, then we're going to be happy. And the, we have in this war many people there are thinking the same way. We just go ahead. This war is everything that we have. So there's no heaven, there's no air, there's no hell. And what we do today is all that we want to do. And if we do what we will, then we're going to be happy. The third group were the Pharisees. They believe that happiness comes from going back. The zealous, they thought happiness came from going against, against power, against authority, against government. The Sadducees, they think that happiness comes from going ahead. And the Pharisees, they think that happiness comes from going back. These were the traditionalists. They were the church that today we call tradition. They want to go to the law all the time. And they didn't want anything to be changed, like many churches are today. They don't want any problem, they don't want any challenge, they just want to keep the tradition, they just want to keep what they have built so far. They think that happiness is just going back to what we have received from our ancestors, the tradition, the culture. They don't want to change that. Actually, the book of the Bible, they the law that we have, the Torah, it was the law of Moses. The five books that we have in the Pentateuch show us the Torah. But the Pharisees, the Israel people, the Jews, they create the Talmud. That is not the Torah. Because the Torah gives us the law of God. But these people, they think the law of God is too hard to keep. So they break down the law of God, creating the Talmud. The Talmud is the book of the traditions of the Jews. So when they were teaching the traditions of the Jews, they breaking down the love of God into the perspective that they understand the love of God. So when Jesus came to, to the Jews, to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they were accused for breaking the tradition. But Jesus was keeping the law. Jesus didn't came to break the law, but to keep the law. But because they accuse him to break in the tradition they crucify Jesus people today are doing the same they want to just be in a comfort zone of the Christianity they don't want to have any challenge in their life they just want to be all the time looking at the things that they have doing so far we are doing this so far so please don't ever try to change what we are doing. We are happy in this. In this war, we have people who have many war views. And they are the same like these Zealots, Sadducees, and Pharisees in the Bible. Even though people, they don't know about the Pharisees, they don't know about the Sadducees, they don't know about the Zealots in the Bible, many non-Christians, they are doing the same thing. As in one of his conference and his book, Ravi Zacharias, one of the most respectable apologetics these days. He's still alive. He's doing conference these days in America. His headquarters in Canada. I like him. I, you can watch his, his sermons. He wa watch his seminars. And his answer to no Christians, he preached in 
He has preached in, in, in Harvard, in Princeton, and many respectable universities. He said like this in one of his conferences. The essentialists live for the moment. The traditionalists live for the past. And the utopians live for the future. Why? Because they all want to be happy. They are all looking for love, for recognition for the world. They are looking for happiness. Now, what made us happy today? Just looking at the past, just going to the past. Or oh, I was happy when I was not Christian. I'm sad I'm Christian now. I was happy when I, I could do everything that I wanted. Smoke, drink, tell lies, fighting with people without regrets, watching even pornography without regrets. But now because I am Christian, I cannot be happy because I'm, I cannot stop to do these things that I'm forbidding in the Bible. So I regret to be a Christian. I'm not happy to be a Christian. You want to go back. You think that happiness is just to go back to your sinfulness. Or you are thinking that happiness is just to go ahead. Okay, I don't care. I have a free will to do whatever I want and I'm already saved by, by, by grace and I can do whatever I want. I can go to church today or I don't go to church today. I'm free to do my will. And I don't care what the pastor say. I don't care what anybody says. I have my Bible. I have God. And I'm doing whatever I want because this is the, the life I have today. Just going ahead. Or you are going against any authority. I don't like this church. I don't like this elder. I don't like this pastor. I don't like this preaching. And you want to be your own teacher. You want to create your own church, your own Bible study, your own group. And many people are doing that. And that's why we have many heresies today. Because they go against the authority of the church. Jesus said, Blessed are those who are poor in the spirit. And how you are poor in the spirit, looking for the kingdom of God. Why? Because if you are looking for the kingdom of God, you can have the happiness, you can have the love, you can have the peace that you are looking for. But this kingdom is not far from us. It's, you don't have to wait for, until the millennium. It's right here. Jesus said, the time has come, the kingdom of God is near, repent and believe the good news. It's right here. It's at the hand. Why? Because if you have Jesus in your heart, you have the Holy Spirit in you, you have the kingdom of God within you. You just need to fight inside of you, not outside of you. If you are just trying to be a Christian, you are just doing a performance. But if you are a Christian, then you can be poor in the Spirit. You can be merciful. You can have peace in your life. You can also experience persecution. We're going to talk about the future weeks about this. But in, in this week, let's look for God. Let's be thirsty and hungry for more of Him. Let's find God in the Bible as, as Deacon Lee just prayed this, this morning. Meditating in God's Word and praying every day. That's basic. Let's go back to the basics. Let's go back to the church and let's bring more people back to church so they can receive the Spirit of God and they can be blessed and happy in Jesus' name. Let's pray.